And so the normal way we think about consciousness is to have a, uh, a foundational premise of what we think ultimate reality is. And you will have physicalists and materialists who think that only the physical is real, and that motivates the, their theories of consciousness. People who believe in God or have theological motivations may, may have reasons to believe in a soul. And if they have that, that motivates their theories of consciousness. So that, that's the normal way people mm. do it. They may not know they're doing that, but that's what they're really doing. I want to try to do the reverse and say, given a theory of consciousness by itself, without any predisposed uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, values about, what can we say about fundamental reality? Can we go in the other direction? And from our notions of consciousness, try to uh, discern or induce what ultimate reality really is. Yes. I have thought about this, and I have some ideas, even phrases and labels that I like. One that I will tell you, am I a materialist, a mentalist, a pantheist, sure. whatever? I do not like to use any labels for mm -hmm. me. One reason is because of the perspective, and there is a phrase that the poet, the romantic poet, British poet John Keats phrase called negative capability. And in a letter to his brother, he said, this is the capability to not foreclose prematurely mm. our notion of what we know. And I think this should be engraved <laughs> in all universities, because I think what we have instead of negative capability are people worrying, thinking that they have their truth when they have one bit of piss uh, of information and not much than that. So I do not think that we are even remotely close or even capable to understand all of reality, and we may never be able to. And so here I will go to another thinker, Marcelo Gleiser, who talks about, he's sometimes referred to as a mysterianist, that says, the more we know, the more we realize how much we do not know. Or Pascal's balloon. You know, the more you are knowing, mm -hmm. the surface is telling you how much more you really are not aware of. And I think it is something uh, of a malady of our days that some scientists believe that because they have great technology, that they have been able to arrive to a good, comprehensive, almost total view of reality. I think that's not the case at all. And you would support that view by the, the complexity of consciousness, because you've studied altered states and you see different aspects of consciousness, so that enriched understanding of consciousness would even give you more uh, reason to be cautious about saying what ultimate reality is. Is that fair? Absolutely. And here, my, uh, my great hero, William James, he was talking about both from a, an epistemological and ontological perspective that he was a pluralist. Uh, he has one quotation, something like, there's no single perspective in which you can comprehend it all. Well, I think he was talking about consciousness as well. There is not a single perspective. There is not a single state, whether ordinary or alternate, where you can really comprehend and understand all there is to be comprehended and understood. Will we ever be in a place where we can do that? I don't think as human beings. We were born with a very limited set of capabilities, wonderful to enjoy life, but we are very limited in our senses, in how we think. We, we think in a sequential way, in how much we can comprehend. So I think it is just a matter of really getting the notion that different perspectives can have different contributions and that we may never be able to come up with one overarching perspective that is going to be optimal for everything. The same way that there is no color that is best for everything mm -hmm. or no tool that is useful for everything. <laughs> is it fair to say, though, that we can support the, this position of a, a diversity or a pluralistic view because the nature of what we do to perceive, which is our consciousness, also has this pluralistic aspect to it? Absolutely. I would say, Right now, I am not a synesthete. That is, I'm not a person who ordinarily, when he hears a sound, 
also sees a color associated with it. Yeah. I'm not like that. There are a few people who have those capabilities. Are they wrong? Are they have something wrong? Not at all. It's a different way of being. I would love to go and listen to a Shostakovich symphony <laughs> and you have as well a plethora, a palette yeah. of colors that would go along with it. I don't have that. Maybe if I took a psychedelic, I might be able, but in my ordinary ways, no. And I see them as different perspectives with different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but there are some things like that which are distortions. I mean, synesthesia is an example potentially of a distortion as opposed to another way to see a veridical reality. Uh, no, I would not say that's a distortion at all. I would say that is a way of apprehending reality because what we see right now, you're saying, well, of course, what we see is visual, but look at being very materialistic at ultimately where our notion of visual experience comes from. Electrochemical impulses that go mostly to the occipital lobe. Right. That's what it is. And what is visual and what is auditory really depends. They are all, the, the ultimate language is just electrochemical impulses in the brain that vary on the areas into which they go. So synesthesia, I would not at all call it a distortion. I would say an alternative way of being in the world. Uh, uh, and one that can provide certain advantages. For example, we know that synesthetic perception allows you to have much better memory than ordinarily because you are able to associate more yeah, things. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Now, I think that there are some people who experience the world in very different ways than we do. Are those ways better or worse? I think rather than a priori state, these are distortions or improvements or you know, uh, the ultimate evolution of humankind, we should need to be careful and say in what, in, in what aspects do we think they are better, in what aspects do we think they are worse, and can we evaluate? Okay, I'm gonna give you a personal yes. example. Um, I have two eyes, like everyone. My left eye, if, if there's a light bulb, I see a light bulb. I see one light bulb and it's reasonably sharp. As I get older, it gets a little blurry, but mm -hmm. you get glasses, so I see one. My right eye, I have advanced keratoconus, which means the cornea is misshaped. And if I close my left eye, that light bulb becomes a hundred um, uh, smears of light. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, if I, you know, I can, I can resolve, I once tried to do it, mm -hmm. you know, I can get about a hundred different shapes. They're all blurred together. Um, and that's what I see. And if, if I only had mm -hmm. that one eye, that's all I would see. That's the way I would think the world is. Uh, that's a distortion. Sure. And there are many distortions and there are many states that are not useful. There are many perspectives that are very likely almost not contributing at all to welfare, to your notion of what this enormous complexity we call reality is. There are many of those. So we have to discuss, evaluate which of those ones are, but what I would say is a priori, a priori, try not to do it, but look at what are the consequences, what is the nature of this, rather than just assume, oh, well, if it's happening in the brain, we have the answer, we know what is occurring. No, we do not know, let's say, to go to the most basic aspect of consciousness, how do what happens in the brain from electrochemical impulses plus a bit of gas that is also affecting. How do we go from that to this wealth, extraordinary plethora of stimuli? We have no idea. <laughs>